Hi, I'm Jess Fields. Welcome to the show. The other day, I interviewed Dr. Jennifer Murchia, a professor of communications at Texas A&M University who specializes in studying rhetoric. And her new book is out this week. I got a pre-publication copy from Texas A&M University Press. The title of the book is Demagogue for President, the Rhetorical Genius of Donald Trump. I admit, when I first received the book, I was struck that maybe this was just a polemical work intended by someone on the left to attack the president, who is a Republican, in an election year. It's a little bit more nuanced than that. Dr. Murchia has been working on this book for several years, and in fact started really primarily to look at the 2016 election and how President Trump, now President Trump, then candidate Trump, used rhetoric along the way to bring people to his side and to win the nomination and then to win the presidency. It's a very interesting work from that perspective. It's about 200 pages long and there's over 100 pages of footnotes, so it's very well researched. Whether or not you agree with what she says about demagoguery, I think the perspective that she brings to the table is worth listening to. Because certainly, if you are opposed to the president, you would view the demagoguery or the rhetorical tactics as a negative. If you're supportive of the president, then you would be able to see that Donald Trump's rhetoric is part of why he has been able to successfully communicate with a huge swath of America. Regardless of your position on the president or the election, and regardless of your political views, I think this is an interesting interview with Dr. Jennifer Murchia and her new book called Demagogue for President, The Rhetorical Genius of Donald Trump. Dr. Murchia, thank you for joining me today. It's my pleasure. Well, first of all, just give us a little bit of your bio and explain uh, where you come from and what got you involved in communications and how you landed at what is undoubtedly the best university in the world, <laughs> Texas A&M University. Absolutely. Um, so I teach classes in rhetoric and politics. Um, I teach political communication. I teach propaganda, argumentation, classes like that. Um, I've been a professor at Texas A&M since 2003 and happily so. And um, I got into communication because I'm fascinated with words and how they work in politics. Um, I briefly thought about, uh, you know, a career in media and realized that that wasn't for me and thought about maybe a career in political communication campaign working and decided that wasn't for me either. And really, I just wanted to read books and write about them and <laughs> teach people stuff, <laughs> so. Okay, so you don't come at this. Um, I, I think the first thing I'm gonna ask you, doctor, is to help explain um, the, the title of this book. And I'm, I'm going to try now, uh, I'm gonna attempt for those who, who maybe are watching this, I'm gonna bring up a, a screen share, um, Texas A&M University Press publishing this um, was very generous to um, allow me to have a pre-publication uh, copy of this. Um, and uh, let's see here if I can, if I can pull this up here. Okay, it doesn't look like I can, but basically, I mean, the, the, the title, Demagogue for President, you've got the, the red, kind of the, the red MAGA hat, and then you've got the rhetorical genius of Donald Trump is the, is the subtitle. And I asked, I called a, a, a person that I, I know to be a strong Trump supporter to kind of get a little bit of a, a take on this because I, I was curious about where this book would slot in in the context of our politics, knowing that you're a professor and this book has, I saw immediately over a hundred pages of footnotes. So it's like, where does this actually fit in? And this is what this person said to me. She said, that book would say, I said, I, I, the question was, I asked her, I said, what do you think about a book titled Demagogue for President, about President Donald Trump? And here's what she said. She said, that book would say that a demagogue is all talk and not really truthful. I'm not really sure what a demagogue is other than that. And then I asked, I said, well, I, I said, I think that the, the point of the book is to talk about rhetorical strategies and how that advances what the president wants. And if you're supportive of that, maybe that's a good thing. And if you're against it, maybe it's a bad thing. And and she said, well, he says stuff, but I don't see that what he says to be divisive. So 
again, this is kind of talking to somebody that's a strong supporter of the president. Could you help explain, is this an attack on the president? Is that your goal with this? Or what, where is your goal in, in releasing a book like this? Yeah, it's definitely not an attack on the president. And I can understand her confusion. I try to make that clear, you know, in the introduction, what the book is about and what a demagogue is. Um, so a demagogue is a leader of the people. That's the literal translation of it. Um, it corresponds with democracy, right? So we would want someone to emerge from the people to lead the people. Um, usually the word has a negative connotation and that's because well, frankly, what we know about demagogues and democracy um, largely comes from people like Plato and Aristotle, Thucydides, um, you know, people who weren't supporters of democracy in ancient Athens. And so, you know, they are suspicious of rhetoric and, um, and democratic government. Um, you know, and so the word is kind of loaded. Um, so I try to unpack what that means. Um, if you look at the Oxford English Dictionary, the first definition of demagogue is someone who defends the people's interests against the other parts of the state. Um, so sort of a heroic figure, someone who defends, you know, the people. Um, and then the second definition is more in line with what we're used to thinking of a demagogue, and that's someone who uses polarizing propaganda for their own uh, personal gain. And so that's a, a, a villainous de demagogue or a dangerous demagogue. And, um, you know, I, I think that that's useful as a distinction. And um, in other parts of Greek political theory, um, demagogues are described as people who would go into the assembly and urge for policies and because uh, anyone could propose policy in the assembly as long as they were a citizen. And then um, if the assembly accepted that policy, then they were the ones who were not actually um, accountable. They weren't the ones who had to pursue the policy. So, you know, a big part of the Athenian political system was about accountability. Um, and so that to me seemed like a really strong criterion for distinguishing between that heroic demagogue who we would want to emerge from the people to lead the people and someone who was a dangerous demagogue, someone who would lead the people astray, mislead the people, who would get people to uh, accept policies that they then you know, rejected responsibility for. And so that criterion of responsibility to me is what distinguishes, you know, these different kinds of demagogues. So someone it, who's an irresponsible leader is someone that we wouldn't want in any political context, whether that's, you know, the Athenian democracy or whether that's today. So what I do in my book is I try to show the ways in which Donald Trump uses language to prevent us from holding him accountable. Sometimes he'll just come out and say it. So recently there was, um, a coronavirus um, press conference and someone asked him directly, do you accept responsibility for, you know, the coronavirus? And he said, you know, very clearly, I do not. I do not accept responsibility. So sometimes he says that, but most of the time he doesn't. Um, and so he uses language in very specific ways um, and frankly, in, in brilliant or genius ways um, to prevent us from holding him accountable. Well, Dr. And that's Dr. what the book's about. Okay, so Dr. Murchia, we're going to get to those strategies. I want sure. to ask you, because you, you seem to draw kind of a distinction, and you, you talk a little bit about this in the book, that demagogue is, again, kind of there's a positive and a negative connotation to the word itself, although most people think of it as a negative. But you mentioned that there's kind of a, a democratic element to demagoguery broadly. I mean, is it fair to say that, let's say that somebody was a, a dictator and they just took the country by force, uh, would it be in a, improper to call that person a demagogue because they weren't really using uh, rhetoric necessarily as as part of that? Like if somebody just does a, a military coup, you know, and they take, you know, power, I mean, like Pinochet or so, you know, something like that. I mean, is that not demagoguery or is there demagoguery involved even like in a dictator? Yeah, so um, around World War II and in, in the aftermath, um, People wrote about totalitarian demagogues, and that sounds to me like what you have in mind there. Okay, okay. Um, using physical force. But, you know, using language as a weapon is a kind of force. And that's one of the points that I try to make in the book is that, right. you know, there's a big difference between um, 
persuasion using language in such a way that you are honoring, you know, the consent of the governed of the people that you're persuading. Um, you know, you're saying that they uh, have eminent value, right, that they have value qua people. Um, and that, you know, they may or may not change their minds to agree with you. And so, um, you know, giving them the ability to consent um, is a very democratic thing. Whereas forcing people to agree with you or manipulating them um, using these dangerous demagogic strategies, those are compliance gaining strategies. It denies the consent of the governed. And so, um, you know, there's a, a corollary between how a person uses language and how they can use physical violence. So I meant to ask you this maybe later on, but since you brought this up at this point, you do talk about weaponized rhetoric early on in the book. So how is it possible for a person, let's say a political leader, as, as here we're, we're referring to this book, uh, Demagogue for Presidents, about President Donald Trump, how is it possible for a person to coerce someone through language, I mean, don't people have agency to decide how they react to what is said on the news media and things like this? They do have agency and, um, and there are rhetorical strategies that honor that. And then there are rhetorical strategies that don't, right? So, you know, if I, if I wanted to persuade you that we should, you know, go to a certain restaurant for dinner, um, you would be aware that I was persuading you. We would be having a conversation. I would say, no, I disagree. We should go here. You know, I wouldn't try to manipulate your emotions. I would be very clear on what I was trying to persuade you uh, to agree with, right? And I would, use, um, I would use strategies that affirmed the relationship between us. Right? I would say, I respect you enough that I want to let you know that I'm trying to persuade you. Persuasion is a meeting of the minds in which you know that I am trying to persuade you. Um, otherwise, it's propaganda, it's compliance gaining. There's lots of other ways, you know, manipulation to describe it. Um, and, and, you know, people who study communication, argumentation, logic, philosophy, um, you know, we have well-developed tools, you know, that we've, we've examined for as long as we've been examining these demagogic techniques, right? 2000 years. Um, and we know how you ought to persuade people. Um, and we also know what it looks like when you're doing it incorrectly. Okay, well, um, I, uh, I, I would like to go from there and really start kind of talking about the strategies that you identify in the book. You identify six strategies um, three that are unifying and three that are divisive. And I kind of want to go and expound on each of them, but could you just kind of go over briefly, what are the three unifying strategies? What are the three dividing strategies? What do those mean before we talk about which each, each is? Yeah, so um, in 2015, I started analyzing Trump's rhetoric um, very carefully. And what I noticed him doing then um, are these six strategies that basically I followed him, you know, using these strategies since 2015. Um, like you said, three of them bring him closer to his followers. So the first one that he uses to appeal to his followers is ad populum. And an ad populum appeal is when you appeal to the wisdom of the people. And for Trump, it's primarily Trump's people. It's not all people. Um, and so he routinely praises his people as the best people, the smartest people, the hardest working, the most American, the most patriotic, right? He lauds them in lots of different ways. He tells them he loves them, um, you know, that he will always fight for them and work for them. And um, in so doing, he uh, positions himself as the leader of, you know, the greatest part of America. And um, and having that relationship between him and his followers is obviously very important to him and to his success. So ad populum is something that he does routinely and has been very successful for him. The second one that he uses is paralipses. And paralipses is I'm not saying, I'm just saying. Um, it's an ironic way of saying two things at once. Um, and, you know, it's really rewarding for Trump because it allows him to give a supposedly candid, like, backstage 
um, view of, of what he's really thinking. Um, it's funny, right, when he says it, usually. Um, and that's rewarding for him because, you know, his audience is entertained and they love to laugh. So they feel this connection. They feel like they really know him. They, um, they enjoy it because it's funny. And then it also allows him to say two things at once. You can't hold him accountable. Um, and that's a very strategic thing for him that is very useful. And the third thing that he does to bring himself closer to his audience is he uses American exceptionalism. And for him, American exceptionalism is basically America winning. And when he tells his hero narrative, he'll tell a story of himself. He was born on Flag Day, and that kind of makes him like America. Um, and he talks about how you know he has won so much in life, and he's just the winner. Um, and and he promises that he's going to make America great again and that he's going to win so easily and he'll win for his people. So they're very complementary strategies, the three that he uses to bring him closer to his target audience. Likewise, the ones that he uses to take him and his audience away from everyone else are complementary to each other and mutually reinforcing. He uses ad hominem. So that's attacking the person instead of the argument. Um, and ad hominem, you know, very popular, you know, with his supporters because it um, says that any criticism of Trump is, um, is faulty or isn't real, isn't legitimate, because the people who are making those criticisms are themselves, you know, hypocrites or bad or, you know, in some way they are denied standing. Um, in fact, it's a, usually a major news item when Trump uses an ad hominem attack. I just read an article this week about um, what his new nickname for Joe Biden was going to be and how his campaign was working on that. Those are all ad hominem attacks when he says low energy Jeb, when he says lion Ted, when he mm. says crooked Hillary, right? Those are ways of changing our focus away from the arguments that those people are making and redirecting them towards the people themselves. The second um, distancing uh, or, or polarizing strategy is to use reification. And reification means treating people as objects. So you deny uh, that people are actually people. Instead, you treat them as objects or animals, um, which means that they have less standing because um, you know, objects have less value and, and fewer rights and shouldn't be listened to. Um, they have less value than people do. So if the real people are Trump's followers and everyone else are these enemy objects or animals, then why should we listen to them? Um, it's traditionally a part of war rhetoric. So throughout history and around the world, um, when presidents want to go to war, they use reification in order to get the nation ready to kill and murder. Um, it's part of genocide, genocidal rhetoric. And then the last one that he uses is... Ad baculum. Ad baculum. Thank you. I always forget one. Yeah, I've, got the, list. I've got the list here, so I'm cheating. <laughs> Thank but... you. You're my hero. Ad baculum is threats of force or intimidation. And um, so this is when you threaten someone, whether it's threatening the press that you're going to um, you know, change liable laws, or whether it's threatening uh, protesters that they're going to get um, hurt, or, you know, whether it's threatening, you know, just even your opposition, if somebody comes after me, they go down the tubes, you know, those are all ways of putting pressure on your opposition, so that they don't um, engage, whether it's, you know, on Twitter, or whether it's in a debate or, or elsewhere in the public sphere. Um, a lot of those strategies are technically fallacies. So if you were in a competitive mm -hmm. debate in high school or in college um, and somebody used an ad baculum threat or they used an ad hominem attack, you would say, you know, to the judge, like, I don't know what to do here. You know, this person has attacked me personally. Um, you know, they're not focused on the debate. And, you know, then there would be a debate about whether or not that was actually an ad hominem or an ad baculum. Um, you know, and, and that person would be not denied standing to debate if they had been found to use those strategies. So, you know, it's not the best of what we expect in, um, you know, rational critical debate. Um, and in fact, you know, there are 
um, lots of reasons to think that those strategies in particular um, erode democracy. So there are um, basically the book, you, you go through kind of a, a timeline of a variety of events throughout the 2016 presidential campaign to, to really kind of bring these strategies, um, exemplify these strategies and, and how you feel they're used by uh, then candidate Donald Trump. I guess it, perhaps it would be appropriate just to kind of go through and, and look at some of the specific examples or the specific uh, points that you feel are exemplified by it. I mean, you mentioned something with the coronavirus. You said that's more of a straight kind of thing, maybe not a, a rhetorical strategy to some of the specifics around coronavirus, but whether from the book or just in general uh, example, I mean, you, you know, as I, I think I mentioned, there's about a hundred pages of footnotes here. So there's a lot of material that you've got in there, but just starting with the very basics, argumentum ad populum. And this is, um, you describe it in the book as an appeal to the crowd. And as you just said, you defined it. So what is an example of how President Trump, then candidate Trump, used argumentum ad populum or, or has sense? Yeah, so in the book, what I try to do is show that we had crisis levels, historic levels of um, distrust, polarization, and frustration in America in 2016, uh, and certainly since. And so what I do is I give an example of Trump using each of those six rhetorical strategies um, in different ways. So to appeal to distrust or distrustful Americans or to increase distrust between Trump's followers and the rest of the political community, um, to appeal to polarized people or to increase polarization, and then to appeal to frustrated people or to increase frustration. Um, so for Ad Populum, I give three examples or I tell three stories of Trump using it. The first one is distrust and political correctness. The second one, you're going to have to remind me, the second one is polarization. Well, I'd, have to, I'd have to go through the book. I guess what I, I'm kind of curious <laughs> about, Doctor, is if you could give, like, I mean, one of this, one, just any example of, of what an appeal to the crowd looks like. I mean, you could sure. even maybe maybe just fabricate one here just for the purposes <laughs> sure. of it. But, so, but just so that when somebody is watching any political leader, they say, oh, well, that's argumentum ad populum. And they feel like, you know, now they've got a great sure. Latin term to use. Sure. So um, one of the stories that I tell is about uh, Trump and political correctness. Um, and so you maybe already knew this, but um, polling in 2015, in 2016 about political correctness was that um, Americans decidedly were against it. I think it was like 81% of Americans were against political correctness. Sure. Um, and so that was an issue that Trump um, sort of routinely uh, used. Um, and so he would answer questions by saying, oh, I, you know, I, I don't want to do that. You know, I'm not going to be politically correct. Um, this doesn't solve problems, that kind of thing. Well, denying um, political correctness is a way of making an ad populum appeal. So sometimes you make ad populum appeals by saying, look at how many people are at my rally. Look at how popular I am, right? So you literally are claiming popularity. Sometimes you make an ad populum appeal by saying, these people are politically correct. They are poll tested political stooges. You know, they're just saying whatever their political consultants tell them to say, and they're not telling you the truth. And my people deserve to hear the truth. And these people won't ever tell you the truth because they're just all politically correct. So doctor, is it fair to say in your view that an ad populum basically sets kind of whoever's speaking their people against other people. It's kind of like appealing to the base kind of thing. It could be used that way, but it's not always. So typically, you know, in again, competitive debate or whatever, an argument outside of, you know, the context of Trump. Um, you know, if somebody makes a, an ad populum appeal, it's usually that the people know more than experts know. So okay. if you were to say, okay. 
you know, the experts and the epidemiologists or whoever say that, you know, it's probably fine for kids to go back to school in the fall. And you said, well, but everyone I know, all the moms I've talked to all are worried. And right. I don't know if those epidemiologists really know what they're talking about. That would okay. be a kind of ad populum appeal that has nothing to do with Trump, right? Okay. So like maybe saying like, you know, I mean, there were certainly attacks on the pollsters throughout that mm -hmm. campaign. And it frankly turned out that the pollsters were incorrect. You know, at the end of the day, the pollsters were, were way off. I mean, at, at the I end. I don't think they were actually. Okay. They, uh, with the, they were within the margin of error. I'm not a pollster, but that was, that's what I've read, you know, is their defense. Well, fair enough. I, and, and I'm not a pollster <laughs> either. I mean, it, it, at the end of the day, I think, you know, as, as you got to the end of the campaign, it certainly seemed like, based on just the polls, Hillary Clinton yeah. would win. And then it was uh, surprising to many when, when Trump won. I think Absolutely. that's fair to say. Um, but uh, including to, to many of his own supporters, it was, it was a surprise. But the attacks on well, the pollsters, him, like <laughs> that, you know, hey, you know, the pollsters don't know, whatever, that would be an ad populum, that sort of thing? Maybe. Um, it, it depends on how it was framed. Yeah, okay, but okay. so so in general, when you're saying like the experts don't know what they're talking about, that the people okay. are wiser, the people the know elites. more. Yeah, okay. it could be a, okay. it could be an attack on elites. It, it okay, could be a lot of those things. Okay, so so really kind of, uh, and you do give some specific examples. I certainly don't want to give away the book, um, but uh, okay. So then the next thing you talk about is American exceptionalism and. Um, I, I thought this was interesting because I don't think of American exceptionalism, or at least um, before reading this, I had never really considered it as a rhetorical strategy. Oh, yeah. oh absolutely. Um, it's absolutely a rhetorical strategy. Um, it's an appeal, right? So um, probably Ronald Reagan is the most famous president um, you know, in the last 50 years to use American exceptionalism. Hmm. Um, and, and he used it differently. And um, most presidents have used it to um, really to describe America's role in the world, America's obligation, um, you know, to sort of be a, a, a role model or a leader to other nations, mm -hmm. to spread democracy. George W. Bush used it that way after 9-11. Sure. Um, and usually it's a um, it's an appeal both to our special status, you know, um, and also to our obligation. Um, so Trump uses it differently than other presidents have done historically, um, which is really fascinating to me as someone who studies presidential rhetoric. Um, but yeah, it's it's routinely a part of um, of how presidents speak to the nation. So what what is different about how President Trump uses the American exceptionalism language is, as a rhetorical device. Yeah, so primarily, like I said, for Trump, it's America winning. So America is okay. exceptional because America wins. And when America is not winning, America is not exceptional. He also doesn't um, really ever, as far as I, I noticed, um, invoke that idea that we have an obligation to the other nations of the world. Um, Trump really sees our role as transactional with the rest of the world. Um, and he says, you know, pretty explicitly that, you know, we're being taken advantage of, that um, we're not winning when we should be. Um, and he blames it on, you know, corrupt leaders or corrupt establishment um, and says, you know, that he can help America to win again. So, so America is different. So Kind of like America just being the best, basically, is is the rhetorical. Yeah, show. I think so. I think so. Okay, and and um, uh, but you do so. I mean, American exceptionalism, broadly speaking, most pretty much every president, I guess, has done that to some extent. Sure, 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 sure. Anytime a president way. is um, appealing to Americans and their values and holding us up as an example, sometimes this is done as a Jeremiah, which is to say that. Um, it's done as a criticism of the nation, right? To say that we're not fulfilling our obligations, we're not doing all the things that we ought to do, we're not living up to our own values and our unique status. Um, other times it's done to motivate us, you know, through tragedy. 
Um, you know, typically when there is a crisis in the nation, the president plays what's known as the priestly role of the presidency, which mm -hmm. is where they invoke our national values and they tell us why those values are going to get us through whatever the circumstances. So the challenger speech that Reagan gave is probably the most famous example. Um, but, you know, there's just a routine that um, the that, that, presidents do and it's it's so common that you know political rhetoric scholars like myself um, have a name for it <laughs> so yeah yes so okay and now we come to because we're still on the unifying strategies there were three the third one which I have to say of everything in your book I was most fascinated by this everybody loves paralypses <laughs> because I had I had to think about all of the times not only with maybe President Trump, but other individuals that I've seen use this strategy. And I thought, I think I've done that, you know? And I thought about the comedian, Jim Gaffigan, who, you know, during his skits, you know, he kind of has his thing going, he's telling a joke. And then he has this high pitched voice that's telling, you know, what he's really thinking. And it's like, and it, all of that seemed to tie in. So explain what is paralypsis? How does the president use this? It's fascinating. Yeah, it, it really is. And like I, I said, um, you know, a lot of people really like this one the most. This is the one I, I get asked about the most. And um, why I like this example is because he acknowledges that he knows that he's using the example in the rhetorical form in the form itself, right? And so people always ask me, like, do you think Trump really knows that he's doing these things? And uh, paralypses is the example that I give them because, you know, I'm not saying that they're all just weak. I would never say that. I'm definitely not saying they're just weak. But if you want to know the truth, I think they are. I think they're just weak generally. Hmm. And so he said four or five times they're weak, but he's not said it, right? So you can't hold him accountable for saying it. And so Trump really uses this strategically um, because it gives him plausible deniability. He can say, well, I didn't say that. I said I wasn't saying that. Um, and in fact, there was a, um, a case that was brought against him by some protesters from one of his rallies, I think in Louisville. And um, the judge initially said that there was plausible, um, you know, plausible deniability would be the opposite. So the, the case could move forward because it was probable that um, Trump had indeed incited violence at this thing. And um, then they looked at the transcript and the transcript says, I say, don't hurt him you know, don't hurt him, he said. And so then the judge said, oh, well, he said, don't hurt him. <laughs> and so, you know, on paper, literally, it looks um, as though Trump is saying, don't do that. But in the moment, and for those people who were in the crowd, it was ambiguous. Um, and so that's why the case was allowed to move forward in the first place. So it's that um, ability to say two things at once that is really um, a powerful appeal for Trump. So, okay. Does this paralypsis, so in, in this particular instance that you're talking about, I don't, I, I obviously without having a transcript in front of me, but does paralypsis require the speaker to acknowledge kind of the thing that they're denying? So, um, oh gosh, I, I, now I feel compelled to maybe find an example from the book because um, <laughs> This was something I had never heard of before, doctor. And um, uh, uh, well, so one of the things is retweets. So, okay. you know, you'll see a lot of people on Twitter have like retweets are not endorsements. Um, retweets are absolutely endorsements. People should not have that on their Twitter because that's not true. When you are retweeting content, you're amplifying it for your audience. And so while you may not want to take responsibility for that content, you are still circulating it and amplifying it. And so you are still you know, saying that thing that you're not saying. So Trump does that a lot with retweets. He'll say, he'll retweet somebody and then he'll deny that, you know, he composed the tweet. I didn't tweet that. I just retweeted it. So, you know, what does that mean? Um, and that's a form of paralypses as well. So, you know, you're asking me about the exact form. Does it have to be, I'm not saying, I'm just saying. Um, I don't think that it does. I think anytime you use that sort of function where you're amplifying content or you are saying the thing that you say you're not saying, um, it takes the form of a paralypsis, even though it's not a perfect configuration. 
So I, I, I felt compelled to find an example. Yeah, what's your favorite your example? Book, hopefully, well, hopefully Texas A&M Press does not get mad at me. I mean, it's your book. I got right? it. So, okay. <laughs> Uh, so here is here is one um, I'm reading from. This is page 147 of Demagogue for President, and we're talking to Dr. Uh, Jennifer Murchia, the author. On, pay, uh, on page 147, on May 27th, 2016, Trump told his rowdy rally crowd in Fresno, California, that Hillary Clinton accused Trump of being, quote, a friend of Putin. Well, actually, Putin did call me a genius, and he said, I am the future of the Republican Party. He's off to a good start, I will say. And then it notes the rally crowd cheered. I will say he's off to a good start, right, folks? And by the way, I am not a friend of Putin. I don't know Putin. I've never met Putin. I respect him. He's a strong leader. So, I mean, certainly within that, there's a couple of different things being said. And I suppose could be interpreted a few different ways, depending, I guess, on what you wanted to to see in it, I mean, is the point of paralipsis to maybe allow someone to kind of conclude what they want to conclude, or what is the purpose of this, in your view, as a rhetorical device? Yeah, that's definitely one of the benefits, maybe, of the strategy. I think of it as a way of avoiding accountability, um, but it's also a way of, you know, ingratiating yourself with. Sure with your group, right? Um, it's a way of, of, you know, sort of winking when you say something um, that, you know, that makes them laugh, that makes them feel like they really know you and they really know what you're, you're really thinking. Mm. Um, that section on Putin and Trump's relationship was so interesting to me because, you know, for, I don't know, maybe 10 years or so, he um, had kept saying, you know, like, am I going to be, you know, his new best friend? Are we going to meet? You know, he is my new best friend. We're stable mates. Um, really um, anchoring is the term, you know, to Putin and to his status. And then, um, and then he very sort of quickly started to say, no, I don't even know the guy. I don't, I don't know him. Um, and it was probably that he was exaggerating to begin with. Um, right, that he was mm -hmm. trying to cultivate a relationship with Putin. Um, he was trying to, you know, be the president of the United States. So trying to anchor to his status sort of makes sense. Um, you know, all of all of that is explainable. But then, you know, there's a very sudden shift because that line of um, rhetoric is no longer useful for him. It starts to become um, a hazard for him in his campaign, and so he shifts very quickly. So there's one other one that actually was the original example I wanted to ask you about. I just couldn't pull it quickly enough, but now I've got it pulled up, um, which was, um, uh, uh, I'm sure a lot of people in Texas remember this specifically, which was when uh, then candidate uh, Donald Trump was talking about Ted Cruz's father uh, in relation to Lee Harvey Oswald, who assassinated President Kennedy. And... Um, Oh, let's see here. That story uh, is fascinating, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's, well, <laughs> I, I, I recall that because um, it was, you know, Ted Cruz, who was his primary rival for the nomination, made a, right. a really big deal of it. He kind of took it and blew it up. And, um, uh, but it didn't seem to have, it didn't seem to have a negative effect on candidate Trump. Not really. I mean, certainly most of Cruz's supporters ended up coming around. Obviously, they didn't hold that against Donald Trump for the most part, I don't think. So so could you talk a little bit about that episode, what happened with all of that, with the Lee Harvey Oswald and Rafael Cruz and all that? Yeah. So one of the interesting sort of subplots in my book is the way that um, Trump took talking points and narratives and frames from different parts of the internet, whether it's um, conspiracy theorists like Infowars or whether it was white nationalists like the Daily Stormer. He did what um, propaganda analysts call narrative laundering. So narrative laundering is like money laundering, uh, right? So you take like dirty money and you um, put it in a business and then take it out and now it's clean money. Um, so narrative laundering is like that. You take um, ideas, you take stories, frames, whatever examples from um, maybe dirty places, less desirable places, and you repurpose them. Um, sometimes they call this mainstreaming or normalizing or whatever. Um, there's different ways of, of describing it. And so the story about Ted Cruz's dad is one of them. 
Um, there's one guy who wrote this story. He's the only, um, he's the only person who, who wrote about it. Um, and he wrote about it on a blog and then he posted it on Infowars and went on Infowars and talked about it. And then next thing you know, it's in the National Enquirer. And then from the National Enquirer, Trump is talking about it on morning news programs. And so, you know, this one guy, um, and nobody can verify the story. Um, and when they try to do research on it, they realize that it's actually impossible to verify the story, which is how conspiracy theory works. Um, it's a self-sealing narrative, narrative that can never be confirmed or denied. Um, and so, yeah, so the story is that Ted Cruz's dad um, supposedly was standing next to Lee Harvey Oswald well, in New Orleans four months before so, um, the Kennedy assassination. Doctor, I actually just want to quote directly from your book. Is okay. that okay? Sure. Because it's, this is it is it is a very interesting story. And again, this is really, I mean, it's, it, regardless of whether somebody is supportive or not supportive of President Trump. Well, it's all fascinating. It's, yeah. it, is, <laughs> it doesn't matter whether you story. support Trump or not. It's um, fascinating. So I'm reading now. This is, um, uh, well, this starts on, uh, let's say, page 59. You talk about how Trump called into Fox and Friends to discuss the Indiana primary and was asked for, okay, Trump called in. He's asked for his reaction to a video of Cruz's father, Rafael Cruz. Um, asking voters to, quote, vote for the candidate that stands in the word of God and on the Constitution of the United States of America. Rafael Cruz was, for those who, who may not know or are not familiar, uh, Ted Cruz's father, obviously Senator Ted Cruz from Texas, a really big booster of his throughout his campaign. And he's a, a pastor um, and has been active in uh, evangelical circles for a very long time. Uh, Rafael Cruz predicted that Trump's election, quote, could be the destruction of America. Trump's response was to call Rafael Cruz's speech a, quote, disgrace, and then to denounce him with an ad hominem attack on his credibility and patriotism. Quote, you know, his father was with Lee Harvey Oswald prior to Oswald being, you know, shot, said Trump, implying that the elder Cruz lacked standing because he conspired somehow with Lee Harvey Oswald. Quote, and this is Donald Trump speaking, I mean, the whole thing is ridiculous. What is this right prior to his being shot and nobody even brings it up? They don't even talk about that. That was reported and nobody talks about it. What was he doing with Lee Harvey Oswald shortly before the death, before the shooting? It's horrible. Then the next paragraph, you give a little bit of a background to this. And I'm gonna continue reading this for a moment if it's all right, because this is very interesting to me. And I, there's plenty more in the book that people can read if they wanna get the book. I had to actually get a copy of the Inquirer to write this part. <laughs> The next paragraph, Trump was referring to an article published in the supermarket tabloid, The National Enquirer, that had recently bubbled up through right-of-center conspiracy sites. The story first originated on April 7, 2016, with InfoWars regular and investigative journalist Wayne Madsen posting a long analysis on the Wayne Madsen report. I think this must be a blog on, on the part of InfoWars, asking, quote, was the father of presidential hopeful Cruz involved in the JFK assassination, end quote. On April 14th, 2016, a short Reddit thread opened up with a link to Madsden's article reposted on a, a blog called Mil Fuegos. On, I don't know what that means, I'm, I'm sorry to say. On April 15th, 2016, Madsden posted the story to Infowars and on April 18th, 2016, he joined Alex Jones's program to discuss the story. On April 20th, 2016, the National Enquirer posted a press release online teasing for its May 2nd, 2016 cover story, quote, Ted Cruz's father now linked to JFK assassination, quote, it exclaimed, promising that the, quote, world exclusive bombshell Enquirer probe reveals the photos that will destroy Lion Ted, end quote. Uh, in their story, the Inquirer quoted Madsen, if it is Rafael Cruz, it raises questions about what he knew about Oswald, quote, to support its claim that the, quote, troubling photos suggest Rafael worked directly with Oswald before he fired the fatal shots from the Texas School Book Depository in downtown Dallas that killed Kennedy on November 2nd, 22nd, 1963. 
Wayne Madsden was the only source for the Rafael Cruz Oswald JFK story. No other credible source for the story emerged. And many news organizations and fact checkers discredited the story. And then you go on to point out that the picture uh, was taken in New Orleans in August 1963. Oswald was distributing uh, pro-Castro literature um, with somebody the person the Warren Commission could never identify. And even if the picture turned out to be Rafael Cruz, uh, there was no evidence that he, the person in the picture turned, had any knowledge of the plot to assassinate JFK. So, I mean, it, it's a very interesting, very interesting background in a lot of ways. I mean, it's interesting because of how news spreads. It spreads very quickly. You know, one thing gets posted online and all of a sudden everyone is talking about it. And um, there are many things that, that we could probably talk about to that effect. Sure. But I think it's very interesting in this context because of the relationship rhetorically, being able to kind of maybe magnify the story, but then sort of deny it. Although I don't know, was there a denial? I, I, I guess kind of bring us through what you kind of found yeah. out about that event. He says, he, people ask him about it, right? So he says, and then I write about this later in the chapter, no, I didn't believe it, but I said, let them talk about it, <laughs> no. right? I said, I didn't believe it. And then after he has denied, you know, believing it, he brings it up again, right? But they wouldn't have put it in there because they could have been sued very badly and they're a very professional organization. So they put it in. So, you know, it must be something that we should be talking about. Uh, it's a great way to circulate rumor and innuendo, to make accusations, but you can't be held accountable because I didn't say it, right? I said, let them talk about it. I didn't believe right. it. Right, yeah. <laughs> kind of familiar to any Southerner who's familiar with the term bless her heart, you know? It's like you could say anything <laughs> about somebody, bless their heart, you know? <laughs> um, but it, it is very it is very interesting. I mean, again, I'm, I'm thinking through, and I guess on some level, because I, I want to be fair, very fair here, if possible, and say that it seems like most politicians probably do this on some level to try to ingratiate themselves to their supporters. I mean, to some extent. I haven't noticed other politicians using paralipses the way okay. Trump does. Um, I mean, I think you're right that probably, um, you know, there's, there's some circulating a rumor and innuendo and, and that kind of thing. I'm sure that that happens. But um, you know, I really think that it, this is one of Trump's signature uh, moves. You know, it's kind of a hallmark for him. He, he, he sort of loves that um, uh, irony in the way of saying two things at once. I'm going to come back to this because after we talk the strategies, then I want to ask you about kind of what it all means and, and what, you know, what, what, yeah. what people who are supportive and people that are critical should think. But now we go to the dividing strategies. Argument ad hominem, probably one that many people are familiar with. Basically, you're kind of attacking people individually, correct? That's right. It's attacking the person. Technically, like it's attacking Ted the person. Like Lion Ted or Low Energy Jeb or this kind of thing. That's right. Or the lying press or, um, you know, I tell a story about um, Trump making fun of a reporter with a disability, um, attacking his person literally um, instead of his argument. Um, and, and, you know, those are things that the media paid a lot of attention to. Um, I think, unfortunately, in 2016, it was so unusual for a political candidate you know, to use that kind of language to make ad hominem attacks. There was a running total on the New York Times about how many times Trump had given, mm -hmm. you know, mean nicknames to people. Um, and, and that was really something that was unusual um, for us to, to hear from a presidential candidate. And some people thought, you know, that it was very unpresidential. Um, and other people thought, you know, he's just telling it like it is. And, you know, they sort of applauded it. So you, um, you don't think it was a maybe that the, is it fair to say that your position is that the media focusing on that so much distracted from something else? I mean, in the book, I think somewhere you said, and forgive me if I can't quote it chapter and verse, but there's somewhere in the book where you talk about the ad fallacies or the, you know, ad populum, ad hominem, ad baculum, kind of distracting or, or taking attention away from other things. Yeah, that's right. So all ad fallacies, that ad part means um, to. So um, to the person, to the threat, 
um, to the people, right? So it's taking our attention away from what was the central point of the argument or the debate and moving it towards something else. Um, and so, yeah, so did the media spend too much time on that? Absolutely. It's not a news item, right? It just uh, mm. helps to circulate the bad um, argumentation, really. Mm -hmm. um, but it was so noseworthy because no one had done that before. Yeah, it controlled the cycle. I mean, of course, every er, now every day when the president tweets something, it's news. Absolutely. Um, Trump, see, this is one of the things that I think um, people really underestimate. And, and that is the way that Trump has, um, I think, brilliantly and strategically controlled the news cycle for the last five years. I mean, sure. if you think about it, there's almost no story aside from coronavirus and the economy now and Black Lives Matter, um, you know, that Trump didn't orchestrate and control. Um, if he wasn't controlling the fact that we talked about it, he was controlling how we talked about it. So his frames were the ones that were the most influential for how we understood things. He's lost some control of the news cycle um, in the last few months. That's because of these crises. But um, prior to that, you know, he had used these rhetorical strategies um, really brilliantly to do what no one had been able to do prior to him. It's kind of amazing. One of, one of the things that you, you have throughout the book in each chapter is you, you start each chapter with a poll of Trump's favorability at the beginning of the chapter and watch it. You can kind of watch as you go through the book as basically his popularity increases. I mean, certainly he was not massively popular on election day with everyone, but he had gone from a, a fairly low point to kind of, you know, bring things back a, a little bit. And I guess maybe through these strategies, is that your position or? Well, um, you know, it sort of fluctuates. So it depends on whether, uh, whether and how he was getting along <laughs> in, that, in that moment, right? Mm -hmm. so, so there's definitely some low points. Um, interestingly, I thought that um, the lowest point for his approval rating was actually right at the moment um, where he secured the Republican nomination. Right, yes. So yeah. right at that time with the Ted Cruz um, right. conspiracy stuff. Well, and, and Ted really Cruz, it, it should be pointed out too, I mean, refused to endorse President Trump right. at the convention, which was quite the scandal when that happened. It was, it was. Um, and so, of course, Trump made fun of him. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it was it was a, it was a big deal. I mean, it was covered. It, it was a it was big covered deal. a lot. I mean, obviously, um, I'm imagining the Trump campaign didn't anticipate that at the time. They probably wouldn't have let him speak. Uh, but it was it was certainly a surprise to people. Um, so then we go to argument ad baculum, which you you define as appeal to the stick, which is I think threats of force. Could you? Yeah, yeah, threats of force or intimidation. Um, I tell a few different stories. One is him threatening the press. You know, obviously that was a very success successful strategy for him. Um, one of the, I think the more interesting ones is that he threatened his supporters um, with second amendment rights. Uh, and I thought that was interesting. I quote actually Ted Cruz at the beginning of that chapter saying, you know, everyone who wants to be president who's a Republican says that they're for gun rights, right? Like that's a no brainer. Mm -hmm. You would have to be insane to not do that. Um, and so, you know, how do you persuade within that environment if you think about it? Like, you know, how do you distinguish yourself when there are 17 people running for the Republican nomination and everybody says that they support gun rights? How do you, you know, convince them that you're the best supporter of gun rights of the 17? Mm. Um, and the way that Trump did it was he used fear appeals and threats um, against his supporters saying that if, um, you know, the Democrats won, if Hillary Clinton won, that they would, you know, basically be murdered, that she had this plan to strip them of their guns, you know, she wanted to open up the borders and let all these people in who were dangerous. And he would um, reenact during his rallies, he would reenact these, um, these terrible terrorist events that happened. And he would, he would, you know, use his hand as a gun and he would shoot people and he'd say, move over and then he'd shoot the next person. And he'd say, move over and he'd shoot the next person, you know, and really sort of interact with his audience. And he was really great at doing that. And it's one of the reasons why he loves his rallies. Um, but yeah, uh, 
ad baculum threats of force and intimidation are uh, very powerful in that, you know, obviously we respond to fear appeals, to other negative emotions like um, threats, like shame, guilt, mm -hmm. frustration. Um, and, and those are very powerful for persuasion. The last of these, Dr. Murchi, is reification which I'm glad to have heard you say it because I had no idea how to pronounce <laughs> that. But reification, R-E-I-F-I-C-A-T-I-O-N, treating people as objects. And you give several examples of that. What would, what would that be? Yeah, um, again, a part of war rhetoric historically, um, a part of genocidal rhetoric. It could be um, calling people animals. It could be... Um, you know, I tell a story of how Trump treats women as objects, and I talk about that in a couple of different ways. Um, probably the one that's the most interesting to me is when he again echoes Infowars and calls um, Muslim refugees um, a Trojan horse. Um, and I like that because, you know, obviously the story of the Trojan horse is that there are warriors, there are people that are inside this object, um, this wooden horse that gets brought into the city. And so, you know, calling them a Trojan horse uh, makes them dangerous. It makes them, you know, in some ways just a plot. They're not even real people. Um, and I really thought that that story was interesting because you see all of the confusion in the public discourse about how to understand the Muslim refugees and the refugee crisis. And there's confusion on the right and on the left about how to understand it. And um, that Trojan horse narrative um, really helps to make it a, um, a sort of understandable uh, story. So it was very useful for him. So now I want to ask you, um, you have a quote towards the end of the book, and I, I didn't put down the exact page number, but in the book you say, quote, did Donald Trump campaign as a heroic demagogue, a defender of the people's rights, or as a dangerous demagogue, a manipulator of the people? He campaigned as both, depending on how you perceive his campaign. Trump is simultaneously America's hero and America's villain. So I quoted from a Trump supporter, a strong, she said, a very strong Trump supporter who I called and just said, you know, respond to this. What does this sound like to you, this book? Although certainly there are, uh, there's a lot of footnotes in here and this book is heavily researched. But on some level though, you must understand that many Trump supporters would say, well, he's telling it like it is. He's saying what people are thinking. That was actually, that was probably one of the things I recall being said back in 2015, 2016 is he tells it like it is. He's saying what other people are just thinking. I mean, what- Yeah, what, I quote what, a lot of people what, saying that in my book. What Absolutely. Would be, what would be your, your response to that? I mean, is that uh, not a legitimate response to what he's saying or or is that just maybe part of the picture in your view or what what is your view of that i think that your friend's response is exactly what my book is explaining right that it we are so polarized we are so bifurcated our understanding of reality is so separate that one person could run for president do all of these things mm -hmm. and we could understand it in completely different ways Mm -hmm. So if you're a supporter, you see him as a hero. Absolutely. And if you're not a supporter, you see him as a villain. Absolutely. Those are incompatible ways of understanding reality, right? Mm -hmm. But we don't share a reality. So that's why I say he's simultaneously America's hero and America's villain. In some respects, though, that would seem to be true for, for other presidents. I mean, President Obama certainly was vilified mm -hmm. by conservatives, just as President Trump is vilified by the left. Sure, sure. But, but, but we would say Obama didn't use some of these strategies. I mean, maybe some of them he did. I don't know. I haven't. Yeah, um, I would say that Obama didn't use those strategies. But yeah, I mean, it's not a book about Obama, right? Um, <laughs> it's a no, book about but I, I guess I'm trying to, again, campaign. what I'm trying to understand is where it fits in because there are, you know, there's people that say, well, he tells it like it is. And, yeah. and you know, this is, I mean, I, I, I know some people that say, well, 
um, you know, they, they hate Donald Trump. And I know people that love Donald Trump. And there's not a lot in the middle, really. It's kind of one or the other for the most part. It's very, very difficult to do, for example, what I'm trying to do with this podcast and kind of sure. be in the middle and, and look at things. And it is very difficult because people are so polarized. How, I mean, how do you think that has even come about, Dr. Murchia? Well, why are we so darn polarized in America? Or have you yeah, not? Yeah, there's out? lots of books about this. Um, there are books and about it's, this. it's fascinating. You know, if you look at the Pew research since 1994, the, the middle has completely dropped out of the right. American political community. And there are groups like More in Common, um, which I think um, are interesting, that are trying to explain that actually we have more in common than we think we do. But the way that information is provided to us through these polarized news sources makes it seem like we don't have as much in right. common. So they did a study that was really interesting a couple of years ago where they asked um, Republicans and Democrats both, um, what do you think about this issue, whether it's you know immigration or gun control or climate change or whatever? And then what do you think your opposition thinks about this issue? And it was the case that on every issue, they were actually much closer together than they thought they were. And then they perceived that they were actually much farther apart than they really were. Right. Um, and so there's something about that. Um, and I really think that, you know, it's about the way that news is consumed and um, created. I think that, um, you know, people benefit from division because then you can yeah. divide up audiences, right? There's a great book about the outrage industry um, that explains that since the mid 90s, um, news organizations, cable channels, radio stations, all that, that used to use um, kind of least objectionable programming, right? Used to go for kind of a moderate middle, didn't want to offend people, didn't want to lose an audience. That instead what they realized is that they could get niche audiences that were very loyal. And they did that through saying things that were offensive, that were outrageous. And that that outrage got people attending to them, right? We're in you know, an attention economy. And so the people who are the most outrageous are the ones that keep and hold our attention the most, unfortunately. That's a terrible way to organize our public sphere, right? You would never ask a communication researcher like myself, like, hey, what's the best way to make democratic deliberation function in America? You would never say, well, let's make the whole public sphere dependent on attention and engagement. Let's make it run on outrage, right? You wouldn't do that. Like those are terrible ways to organize the public sphere. And unfortunately, that's the public sphere that we live in. Ooh, yeah, that's a tough one. I mean, you know, I, I think about how during Obama's presidency, Fox News had blowout ratings. And during Trump's presidency, MSNBC has had blowout ratings and has sometimes even beat Fox, which would have been unthinkable only a few years ago. And it is that clearly I everyone- Fox is, is, I think Fox has had higher ratings during Trump's presidency as well. Yeah, I think I mean, people are just paying more attention to the news right everybody, now. Everybody, but well, everyone yeah. is paying more attention, and they're yeah. divided. But but you know, MSNBC's yeah. gone up, Fox. They're all you know. Um, uh, I, I read an article just the other day that CNN, uh, of course, it has fairly strong um, critical of Trump programming in its primetime lineup, but during the day, it's more straight news. And uh, CNN has seen its ratings rise uh, during the pandemic because it is seen as more of a neutral news source by most mm -hmm. Americans, which is kind of a curious thing that it takes a pandemic for people to seek that out. Whether CNN is that or not, uh, I'll let people decide for themselves. But it is interesting. Yeah, I, I can't watch the news. I don't yeah. watch it. No, I, don't I, don't have a, I don't have a TV in my house. So I, yeah, I, uh, I, I only read the news because right. I, can't, I can't handle it. It's way yeah. too intense with the music and the scrolling and the camera angles and all of it. It doesn't matter what station it is. I can't. I don't receive information that way. <laughs> Let me ask you, doctor, if there were another, let's, let's say, you know, regardless of who wins this year, whether it's President Trump winning re-election or uh, former Vice President Joe Biden, in another four to eight years, there will be another election in which nobody who's in play now will be running, right? You'll have fresh people, I guess. And let's say there was a candidate that wanted to read the candidate 
was smart enough to read Texas A&M University Press. And then they picked up Demagogue for President. They said, ah, I bet I could use these strategies. Do you think these strategies are evergreen? Would this work in eight years, 10 years, 20 years? I don't. Um, okay. I think that 2016 was a unique year. And I think that Trump is a unique candidate. Mm. Um, I, don't, I don't think that they would work for other people. Um, and, and I hope that they wouldn't. But one of the things that, that Trump had that I think other people um, maybe won't have, but I'm not sure, uh, is that he was just defiant about it. You know, it didn't matter, you know, what you said, how you critiqued him, he would not admit that he was wrong or accept, you know, he wouldn't move on from an issue, right? He would fight it out. And, um, and that I think is unique. I think that the, the context of 2016 was unique. I mean, you couldn't run the 2016 campaign in 2020. You couldn't have run it in 2012, right? So the way that, um, you know, social media took off in 2016 in ways that it didn't exist in 2012, certainly in ways that it didn't exist in 2008, um, you know, the way that it's changed now compared to then, um, the way that platforms have responded to political discourse, that algorithms have changed, you know, there's just so many different things that um, have happened since 2016 that I think that you probably wouldn't have the exact same outcome. So let me ask you, doctor, I'm curious because I think in my mind, as we go through this, I think about the past presidents, since you, you study presidents, and I think about Grover Cleveland, who told his supporters to go ahead and admit that he had fathered a child out of wedlock or you know, John F. Kennedy went and on, pre on television and had this big mea culpa about the, the Bay of Pigs and, and uh, past presidents that have um, had different ways of relating with regards to how they communicate with the public. So just to keep this thing out of the realm of partisanship, let's say, maybe before 1968, who is your favorite president in terms of how they communicated uh, rhetorically? Or who do you feel did the best mm. job? My goodness. Um, hmm. That's a hard one for me. Uh, <laughs> so I love, um, I love to read Thomas Jefferson. Um, I love to read, you know, that's inspiring to me, his political philosophy. I love to read Abraham Lincoln. His, his, his words were lyrical, right? And musical. Um, my dog would like to give her opinion. Um, I can I see the, I, I, I'm predicting a uh, uh, absolute <laughs> flood of emails from angry Whigs who are upset. John Quincy Adams, absolutely. Um, he was a little bit Ciceronian for my taste, but uh, a good Whig nonetheless. Yeah, he was, he was the favorite president of uh, a high school history professor of mine who was absolutely insistent that he was the most underappreciated president. Well, he had the first chair in rhetoric at Harvard. So oh, interesting. Um, for that reason, I aspire to that position someday. If you're listening, Harvard, I'm ready. Just call me over. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Okay, so interesting. So um, I guess let me ask you this, um, Doctor. I think you've addressed all of this, and it is a very interesting topic, a very interesting book, really, regardless of where somebody comes down. And uh, anybody that has listened to my program knows that I like to consume a wide variety of media uh, uh, resources, as well as uh, also different books. And I think that's really the only way that we know, know more about the world that we live in. It's if we're willing to, to mm -hmm. go and, and read different things. So somebody that's a supporter of the president, I think will find things in this, in this book that are interesting. Somebody that's a critic will find things that are in this book that are interesting. Overall, as you get to the conclusion of the book and you get to the conclusion of this discussion, doctor, what do you want people to be left with? What is the final impression that you really want to leave with those yeah. who engage with this work? I'm going to put my dog back on this chair, hopefully. Um, I, I hope um, that people will understand that Trump is a very strategic speaker. Um, I think that people underestimate him, and I don't think that that's useful. Um, I think it's, it's better to understand that he actually does routinely use these six strategies and that they're very effective for him. 
He deploys them when he needs them. He pulls back on them when he doesn't, um, which is part of you know what I try to show in the book. And um, I hope that people will decide for themselves what they think about them, right? So I give you a standard of judging, which is to say like, what is good for democratic deliberation and um, you know, what causes democratic erosion or democratic backsliding according to research and, and historical studies. Um, but you know, my hope is that people will, will read this, will learn to identify the strategies um, and will see why they're being used uh, and will decide for themselves what they think about them. Any, any other thoughts to add, Dr. Murcia? Mm, can't think of anything. Okay. Right. <laughs> well, well, very interesting. Uh, Dr. Jennifer Murcia, uh, professor of rhetoric uh, in the communications department at Texas A&M University, uh, widely acclaimed by all, of course, to be the greatest university uh, in the history of the world. No reason to go to Harvard, Dr. Murcia. With the uh, most whoop. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and her new book, Demagogue for President, being released by Texas A&M University Press, presumably, I'm guessing, available on Amazon everywhere books are sold. Right, doctor? I believe so. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Jennifer Machia. Thank you. And that was Dr. Jennifer Murcia a professor of communications at Texas A&M University, talking about her new book, Demagogue for President, which is out this week from Texas A&M University Press. If you like the show, please subscribe on YouTube or in your favorite podcast app. And I appreciate so many of you subscribing. The show continues to grow dramatically. And thank you for telling your friends and family. I hear from a lot of people who are listening that I don't even know are listening, and I really appreciate it. Listen, I'm thinking about starting to release this on a more regular basis. You may notice that I release it kind of haphazardly. The last one before this was a couple of weeks ago. Sometimes I release several over several days. Is there a day of the week that you think would be the best day to release this podcast? Let me know. And if you have any good ideas for a guest, let me know that too. Email me at jessfieldshow at gmail.com. Thanks for listening.